This conference will up. now be recorded. And if there's anything you don't like about it, then um, just let me know and I won't send the recording. I can do a separate one for them, okay? I'm sure it'll be fine. Thank you. All right. I'm gonna try to get rid of this. Okay, so this is gonna be a, a rush through botany, um, which would normally be a semester long or four month course, right? So just gonna give the basics. And this is my contact information, which you have. But if you have suggestions or questions later on, please contact me there. And the picture that is depicted here is a flower called a stipelia. And just to illustrate how incredibly complex these are, this thing builds up a gas. It's like a big bulb and it's in a um, uh, euphorb. It, so it has this like bulb that's like a gaseous balloon that is the flower before it opens. It explodes open so to speak and that gas is released which smells like rotting flesh to attract the pollinators that pollinate it which are fly pollinators but it does more than that the actual topography of the petals mimics muscle tissue so the flies feel like they're having a tactile experience of walking on meat which is kind of crazy all right now if i can advance all right um more in terms of the craziness of pollination which i'll get into more when i talk about the flowers these this is euphorbia which i'm going to mention later on and these are little nectaries so just remember that euphorbia and little nectaries All right so botany is the study of plants their evolution a little bit of ecology but more as it pertains to their evolution and a lot of anatomy and systematics so systematics is just the lineage of evolution right trying to follow the forever branching tree, pardon the pun, of speciation in botany. Horticulture is the study of how to grow plants. It's more at the population or community ecology level. So it considers how plants interact with non-plants like the microbes in the soil, um, how they, if you want a companion plant, how plants play well or don't with each other. And then arboriculture is the proper care and cultivation of trees specific to their survival um, and not necessarily to the quality of their wood and its value in a market, which would be silviculture. All right, so this is an overestimation. There's around 300,000 known species of plants. So we're gonna speed through the major plant groups, just giving some of the major characteristics that will help you differentiate those plant groups. Um, so that means a uh, very brief introduction to things like this. Can you see my cursor moving here? Cursor yeah. moving? Yes, okay, I can great. see that. Yep. So bryophytes, mosses, those are your mosses and liverworts. And then we'll be differentiating the rest of plant groups from that. That includes the ferns, angiosperms, those are your fly plants. That's what we typically think of. We think of plants and gymnosperms, that's your non-flowering or coniferous, so your pines, uh, spruce, cycads, ginkgos, those are your gymnosperms. All right, so plants have a lot of specialized tissue types, just like any other organism, right? And so there's the epidermis, which is like the skin, vascular tissue, which is like the veins. Then there's this cool, really cool part of the plant that's called the meristematic region, it's not a tissue, but it's a, a, a covering or a focal point within the plant itself or plant organs that are basically the stem cells of plants. I'm going to more about that in a minute. And then of course, there's the reproductive tissues. Those are organs like the flower is an organ or the fruit. Um, and then, okay, so specifically vascular tissues, this is one way that uh, we differentiate between uh, what are called ancient plants um, that are non-vascularized, that's your bryophytes, they don't have any vascular tissue, whereas ferns, and then as we, ad I'm going to use the word advance in evolution, but it's not really advanced, it just means advancing through time, not necessarily advancing in complexity. But the ferns onward have vascular tissue. So vascular tissue is composed of two major types of tissues. That's the xylem and the phloem. 
And these are basically the conducting or the veins, but also the bones of the plant's body. Right? So these plants that are a couple inches tall to a couple hundred feet tall, they don't have any skeletal tissue. And so these incredibly complex, elongated, um, connected cells that have fibers often with them are also the bones of the plant and they allow it to not only move and bend in the wind without breaking, but also to stand tall, so to speak. And they're made of long chains of carbons, basically carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, which of course we know plants make their own food, right? And that includes uh, the production of particular types of carbohydrates that are really terrific at not breaking down and being bone-like. And that in, these are lignin, cellulose, and a thing called hemicellulose. So water, if you've ever lived in the desert, you know about xeric landscaping or drought landscaping. So the water conducting and ion conducting tissues are in the xylem. So I just think xeric xylem water. Oh, Danya has arrived. Um, Danya, I'm recording this and I will send it to you, okay? All right. Um, yeah, so the xylem, I remember the difference between xylem and phloem, but just thinking xylem is water conduction, uh, xeric landscaping, that helps me out. And like I said, this is where your potassium and your other large minerals, your phosphates, et cetera, are gonna move in one direction that's from the roots to the canopy of the plant, whether the canopy is a tomato canopy or a spruce canopy. And then the phloem is going to transport water and carbohydrates in both directions. So your carbohydrates are the sugars that the plant makes utilizing the energy from the sun. And these are basically carbon, hydrogen, oxygen compounds. And so these move in both directions. It's what we tap for maple syrup. So the vascular tissues are, and just interrupt me if you have a question, okay? These vascular tissues and the carbons that they form are really important in terms of maintaining the integrity of a plant's ability to access light and do everything it needs to do and stick around for, you know, hundreds of years if it's a tree or throughout the growing season if it's ephemeral. These complex chains, what makes them very resistant to breaking down and able to hold a plant that is hundreds of feet tall is kind of amazing, right? It kind of defies um, at least my ability to conceive of it. So the cellulose, they're all, and the hemicellulose and the lignin, they're all rings of carbon. So every little corner has a carbon. And these thicker lines or these double lines mean that there are two bonds holding that carbon. So this is a very stable state for a molecule. And when you think about the fact that every living thing is composed of basically molecules in stable or semi-stable states, it's kind of mind blowing. I think it's pretty fun. Um, so then when you add to this long chains of carbon, so there's C carbon here, carbon, 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 and connect these all together end on end, like we see here, with these long lignified fibers attached to the xylem, then you've got something that is able to have tensile strength, so resist wind movement, but be able to move with the wind and also stay around for a very, very long time. Because it's hard for anything to break these down. I don't think I'll have time to get to it, but there are some fungi that have the enzymes that can cut through these, but there are not very many of them. They're really rare. And they're so rare that they're actually being, um, they're using a lot of research for bioremediation. So breaking down uh, some complex or um, recalcitrant compounds that would be toxic as well as breaking down woody tissues or plant tissues for use in biofuels. All right, so what we get stuck in our teeth when we're eating celery or the kids are eating celery is the xylem and the phloem. Okay, so you can tell somebody that next time they get sorry, long things stuck in their teeth, they've got vascular tissue or veins in their teeth. That could freak them out. Um, and uh, so xylem is actually, when it's mature, it's actually dead cells. So these 
elongated cells that are connected end on end, they die. And, but their function continues to be this conduction of water and ions from the roots to the top of the plants. They have really, really thick cell walls. Okay, so they're incredibly important as bones. Whereas the phloem will have a thinner cell wall and um, is considered more important in terms of the tensile strength of a very tall tree. Um, so this is just breaking it down. Some of the major differences between the two groups. In terms of wood architecture and what's important for um, people who are treating trees, like me, <laughs> uh, is to know a little bit about um, how the, the pattern is of this xylem and phloem, or even a woodworker, a woodworker needs to know this as well, the pattern of the xylem and phloem inside the plant. So you can have conifer, which is integrated. So you've got little teeny tiny xylem phloem cells, but they're like, perforated throughout, right? So they're just um, throughout the body of the woody tissue. This is called soft wood. Uh, it's really a great plan or design if you're gonna live in environments where you might be exposed to a lot of water stress and you're growing really tall. And so this is a pretty good design. Diffuse porous, this is what you find in the liriodendron, the tulip poplar or yellow poplar, maples and cherry. And so this is diffuse pores where the xylem and phloem are sort of um, throughout the plant. You still get a heart tissue. As the plant matures, that heart tissue has a different uh, density than the um, new wood that's put on each year. But throughout that new wood and old wood is this diffuse porous distribution. And this is important if you see a tree that's hollowing out and it's a maple, it may not be able to stand hollowing out, uh, especially if it's exposed to a lot of wind because of this diffuse porous pattern. Whereas, I can't see this one, the ring porous pattern over here that you find in oaks, hackberries and elms is more stable if the plant rots at the heart. So if you get heart rot, because of the ring pores architecture of the xylem and phloem, um, those plants can actually stand a lot longer um, than they would otherwise. And these guys are actually, they're, this is considered more recent evolutionarily, and they're more resistant to drought and freeze thaw cycles too, because of the, the um, diameter of a lot of their xylem phloem vessels. All right, I'm not going to get too much more into that unless you have questions. Okay, so the plant, when you think about a plant leaf, it looks pretty darn simple, right? And especially those needles on conifers, but they're not so simple. They have an epidermis up at the top, and that epidermis is covered in wax or um, a waxy oil, and that's obviously to protect it, right? It protects it from too much UV, and it also protects it from moisture loss. Underneath that is a palisade layer, and that layer is full of the chlorophyll along with this spongy mesophyll, which would be a lot thinner in a, in a needle or a conifer scale, and then this idealized leaf. And that's full also, it's a place where um, UV energy can be turned into chemical energy, but it's also got a lot of gaps between the cells in that mesophyll layer, and that's for a lot of gas exchange. Plants, just like any other living organism, have to have an exchange with the atmosphere, so to speak. And so this is where the carbon comes in and the oxygen comes out, lucky for us. And so those air spaces are critically important for trapping both moisture as well as gas exchange with the atmosphere. Um, let's see what I forgot. Oh yeah, so these are, oops. Ooh, let me go back. Well, here. I'll go back to it later. Okay, so these are the stomata, and these are openings in the epidermis that are specifically, so this is um, very recent evolutionarily, um, hundreds of millions of years ago, but still recent as far as plant history goes. These stomata are little openings for the exchange of gas. They're really important in transpiration, okay? So, um, when these guard cells get puffed up with water, that closes the stoma. When the ions are pumped 
to the outer cells away from the guard cells, that causes the water that was in these guard cells to flow into those adjacent cells and the stoma opens up. When the stoma opens up, you have uh, escape of not only oxygen, but also water vapor. And then the intake of carbon dioxide for the plant to use to make its food. All right, so that escape of water and oxygen, especially the escape of water actually, is critically important to the passive process of moving water from the roots of the plant to four inches in the air or a few centimeters in the air or hundreds of feet in the air, right? So it's not, water's not pumped from the root to the top of the plant. It's a completely passive process. Um, and of course that release also can add a little evaporation, cooling, so evaporative cooling. So it can help keep these cells from getting too hot. So these, it's kind of a simple system of just osmotic potential that allows the plant to sort of have a, a way to cool itself off, to take in more carbon when it needs it, to shut, close these off and protect itself from getting dehydrated. All of these things happen because of these guard cells. And then these are little waxy substances, little waxy cuticle builds up in here. This here is a bacteria. And what's also really cool about these plants, this could be a pathogenic bacteria, but it's also equally likely that it's a bacteria that actually captures nitrogen and then makes that nitrogen captured from the atmosphere accessible to the plant cells. All right, so plants also have on their cells trichomes, and these trichomes are, are what make cannabis so attractive to people because that's where the THC is. Um, but the trichomes for the plant are really a protective. So they are a protective element in that sometimes they're shaped like umbrellas, literally like the skeleton of an umbrella, and they do exactly that. They shade the plant from too much UV. So even if they're straight like this, if there's tons of them, they're gonna protect these cells under here from getting too much UV. These guys are tipped with a little bubble. That means there's probably some sort of maybe formic acid like stinging nettles. So stinging nettles have a little tip at the top that's got formic acid in it. Sometimes these are made of glass, literally silica. Um, and so when you go to prune the plant or touch the plant, you get those silica hairs breaking off into your skin, which is not so comfy. All right, any questions? Okay, what's ancient or what preceded those fancy stomata are these simple pore openings along the trunks of trees. Okay, so if you remember from your biology class in high school, the Carboniferous Forest had those uh, giant ferns. Well, those giant ferns um, had these in them, in the trunks of the trees for gas exchange. And these things are lenticels, it's a specialized tissue that's got a bunch of pores in it. This is a birch tree. Um, can you guys think of other trees that you've seen these kinds of lenticel-like pores in? I can't. Sonia? Okay, maybe she's here in name only. Um, Cherry, cherry bark. You know that uh, mm -hmm. shimmery with the lines, the lateral lines on it? I That's don't know. All... I don't know <laughs> if I've looked at a cherry tree that close. Oh my God, Connor, what have you yeah. been doing with your life? I know. <laughs> Apologies. Okay. Well, you can fix that. All right. So, anyway, those are basically pores, and these are throughout the trunk of the tree, the stems, and also in the roots. So if the plant can't exchange gases with the surrounding environment, then it's going to basically have some sort of negative repercussion, which is why when we bury our trees in mulch, they tend to choke themselves to death. All right, here's the Mary stems that I was talking about before. These are really cool. So these are stem cells. They have no identity, right? So they can become whatever they want. And um, it's probably around under here, under this root cap. So the roots have a root cap that helps protect those new young cells that are growing and elongating the root um, as it moves through the soil. 
So they make a specialized set of cells that just basically help a root move through that probably not very hospitable soil. Um, and then here in the apical meristem, this is gonna be the top growing point of a, of a, a stem or uh, yeah, any stem. And this can become a flower. Uh, it can give rise to just a continued elongation or here along the side, you can get, this is all meristematic tissue. This can give rise to another branch like it has here or to a leaf. So these are totally undifferentiated cells, just like we have in our bodies. But unlike us, plants don't really lose the ability to make stem cells as they age. Well, except for trees, when they get really, really old, they lose the ability. But um, most plants continue to be able to make just as many stem cells when older as they do when younger, until they get to senescence. Um, but senescence for them is right at the end, typically. It's not quite as long as it is for us. So what is the what causes them to become either a flower or a stem? I mean, what is the is it stresses or other things? Well, that's a great question. Yeah. So it can be stress. So a lot of organisms will try to reproduce when they're stressed out. And so whether it's fungi or bacteria or plants, if it's stressed, it will send a bunch of hormone signals. So what's going on up here is a bunch of molecules are dancing around this section and they're telling this, basically telling this meristematic region, hey, we need more leaves. We got a lot of sunlight here. We don't have a lot of root growth. We need a lot more sugar going down to make more roots, right? So those molecules are shuttled up to here and they'll say, tell them, you know, need more leaves or things are bad. We need to like have a major mast of seeds produced. So make a flower, buddy. So yeah, these signals come from the outside world to the plant and then the plant uses chemistry to basically tell itself what to do. Did that good answer? Okay. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. All right. Um, this is a bit of a segue, but the meristematic abnormalities are pretty cool. Uh, they can make things like crested saguaros. If you guys have ever seen the saguaro cactus pictures or been to the desert and seen them where instead of having that nice oval top, they suddenly balloon out into a shape almost like this. That's called a crested saguaro. And then these monstro succulents, they're caused by the same thing. It's a mutation. You get a mutation in that meristem, that apical meristem, and it suddenly produces a bunch of apices all across the. And so instead of one that produces a nice ordered um, phyllotaxy or a leaf arrangement, you get a bunch of little meristems um, producing something at the same time. And so these can be quite uh, expensive and people try to uh, utilize these tissues to take that mutation and make more monstro succulents or crested succulents or cacti. Uh, let's see. So these are the different meristematic regions, but I'm not going to get too much more into that. Okay, so roots. Roots are incredibly important, obviously. Um, they have to take the water, oxygen, and minerals. So one thing that people fail to realize is roots need water and oxygen from the soil and soil is composed of a tremendous amount of space. It might be microscopic space, but it's critically important space. And that's why plants, if they're deprived of uh, oxygen because they're sitting in water and they're not adapted or evolved to sit in water, um, will die because massive cell death, right? Uh, so the um, gas exchange happens in those lenticels or other types of pores that are in the root hairs. So the root hairs are these microscopic uh, appendages along a root, and they are what are prim primarily responsible for uptake of nutrients and water in the plant. All these little hairs along these bifurcations are contributing to a tremendous amount of surface area. And that surface area is what provides plants with a lot of access to the micropore environment of the soil. In addition to that, most plants, 
90 some plus percent have a beneficial relationship with fungi of many types usually. So this is, I'm not just talking mycorrhizal, but lots of other fungi and bacteria that further extend the surface area of these roots. In fact, there would be no land plants were it not for fungi. So the, the well-supported theory, um, it's moved from hypothesis to theory, is that uh, land plants evolved as a result of a mutualistic interaction with fungi. So that mutualistic interaction predates the formation of roots. Let's see, uh, taproot. So a lot of plants produce a taproot. A lot of the gymnosperms will retain their taproot. And the taproot is very, very important, not only for mining deep soil depths, uh, especially for a lot of the gymnosperms that are growing in alpine areas that are exposed to a lot of drought stress, but where a water table is somewhere down there, the taproot can go way down to mine and find that water table. Same thing in the desert. So all desert trees basically have a taproot. There's no way they would make it in life without a taproot. Um, out here in the temperate forest, a lot of plants will lose this taproot. Like the uh, maples lose their taproot and they produce sinker roots instead. And the sinker roots are, kind of come off these lateral roots and sort of anchor the tree to the ground. And then what's also a lot of people don't realize is that the lateral roots extend two times or more the height of the plant out. So whatever height your tree is or your shrub is, the roots that are primarily involved in nutrient and water uptake, they're way out here beyond the canopy. So that's one reason why mulching is kind of a waste of money and also typically not healthy for the plant. Let's see, okay. All right, getting into the major uh, groups of fungi, I'm sorry, plants in the plant kingdom. So these are the bryophytes or mosses. Okay, right here. They're different from ferns. They're not the same as lichen. Lichen is a mutualistic, mutually beneficial relationship between bacteria, cyanobacteria, which are um, photosynthetic bacteria, and uh, fungi not a plant. It's actually more closely related to an animal than a plant, which is kind of wild. So these are the bryophytes. They don't have any vascular tissue and they don't have any roots. They're super old, um, older than any other existing species. So these mosses have been around, or at least their ancestor, if you consider them in linkage with their ancestors, they've been around since plants made it to land. So they don't have any vascular tissue and they don't have any roots. How do they get their nutrients? Well, they basically get their nutrients and resources from it, direct exchange through pores with the air and also with the soil and with their microbial partners in the soil. So without their bacteria and fungal partners in the soil, they can't make it. Um, and then they obviously have to be in really uh, wet habitats because water is moving across the membranes of the tissues, of the cells in the tissues, and that's how they maintain uh, their internal water supply. And I'm not gonna get into the, if you guys want me to get into the evolution a little bit, algal or turidiophyton, I almost messed that up, which just means fern. I can go into that, but uh, I don't, I'm taking a long time already, so. All right, and I wanted to just segue here because a lot of times, so the, the algal hypothesis for the evolution of plants is that algae are able to photosynthesize. They have chlorophylls. Chlorophylls are these specialized cells that are have antenna in them, and those antenna can capture the electrons from sunlight and then run an engine basically inside the plant or inside the algal cell. So a lot of people thought for a long time, plants came from algae. But through the molecular signature, uh, looking at the DNA, the molecules in the DNA, it looks like at least there's some evidence that plants originated from something like a fern 
or bryophytes originated from something like a fern, and then they got more simplified. So this allows me to segue just a little bit about evolution. Evolution can move forward and backwards. We often think of evolution as this progression towards increased complexity and advancement, meaning improvement, not just change. But that comes from the early um, literature around evolution, which assumed that humans were outside of nature. And because we were the image of God, we, we were the um, epitome of perfection, right? And so that meant that evolution had to have some sort of march to an end goal of perfection, humans, right? It couldn't go backwards. It couldn't be just good enough. It had to be perfection. But if any of you guys have ever seen a dung beetle in your compost pile or those green iridescent beetles that fly in the summer, they are terrible flyers, They're awful. They have these little teeny tiny thin wings and these big heavy clunky bodies and they don't have to fly well. They just have to fly good enough. It's why um, human beings have a hard time with their spine when they get older because your spine just has to be good enough to get you through reproductive success. And that's all evolution cares about. So it's not really aimed for any ideal of perfection. It's not a, it's not a thinking thing. All right, um, so I'm gonna skip past that one. All right, so the ferns and the fern allies are what come next. These guys are vascularized. So they're the first ones to come onto the planet, but like they got all the tissues they need. Um, they have rhizoids instead of roots. So if you guys have ever dug up a fern, or kicked one or tripped over one hiking, the stem of the fern is actually underground and then it's got these things coming off it that are not roots, but they look sort of root-like. Those are rhizoids. They just don't have a lot of specialized structures that we see in roots, but they are basically uh, a way for the plant to um, attach itself to the ground more firmly um, and also a new development in accessing nutrients and microbial partners. But these guys are different um, from the angiosperms and gymnosperms that we get to next because they don't make seeds, all right? So they have sort of a rudimentary, um, it's actually, they don't even have a flower. If you turn a fern leaf over, it has a bunch of spore or freckles on the back of it. And those are its spores. Those are its reproductive bodies. Because they don't need or have roots, and they continue like with the bryophytes and the mosses to get a lot of nutrients from the air. A lot of these ferns are epiphytes or air plants. And mycophytes and pteridophytes or ferns and the fern forests from the Carboniferous period are basically what fuel us today. So that's where our, our petrol comes from. All right, the gymnosperm. So these are the non-flowering totally rooted, have seeds, have vascular tissue, but they don't have fancy flowers because they're wind pollinated, okay? So these are your spruce, pines, sidecads, and ginkgo. So ginkgos do not have flowers. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, they have that diffuse or inter integrated porosity or integrated vascular system that makes them a soft wood. And without fungi, these are these have an obligate relationship. So they have to have a microbial partner. They have to have a, a mycorrhizae specifically. They have a relationship with a bunch of other different microbes in the soil. There's usually um, hundreds of different microbes in what's called the rhizosphere or the root habitat. And the reason those microbes are there because roots are actually excreting chemistry telling the microbes, hey, I'm here, come on over, let's hang out, right? So they get their, uh, they utilize their chemistry to get their friends in that microbial or um, root microbe rich space called the rhizosphere. All right, so here is a flower, a female flower of uh, a ginkgo. And all it is, is a very simplified stigma. There's no petals, there's nothing, pretty about it. There's no nectary to attract any insects. And then the male flower is this, and these once these pollen um, 
anthers are mature, the wind will just blow and these trees will grow close enough to each other and the pollen is in the billions and it's fine so that fine pollen will eventually find home to one of these and produce something that's like a, well, like a fruit on here, but it's really just a, a seed with a thick coat around it. Or it'll produce a fruit like this called a cone with a seed in it. So the gymnosperms have um, two houses which I'll talk about in a minute. One house has the males and one house has the female flowers. They don't have plants, male and female, on the same plant. They're on separate plants. All right, so the angiosperms are flowering plants. And it's the hypothesis is, which is another one that's pretty well supported, is that we have flowers because we had insects first. So the first, most simple flowers uh, appear to have been pollinated by beetles. They were very close to the ground. And uh, the beetles actually, the insects were quite large back then. So it would have been very easy for beetles to um, interact. And the cool thing is, is that down in here inside this cherry flower, there's little nectaries, right? I mentioned that Euphorbiaceae in the beginning with its little red velvet nectary. Well, a lot of flowers will have a little nectary down there. And that nectary sends off sugar signals. It's like walking next to Cinnabon or something, right? You get that sugar signal for the insect. What might have happened is that in the early flowers, they didn't have any nectaries, but they might have accidentally leaked a little bit of sugar water. And it could have just been a mutation that would seem maybe, uh, we often think of mutations as being disadvantageous, but they're actually the way speciation happens without mutations, you don't get species, you don't get variation, you don't get diversity. So it could have been just a mutation that allowed a couple of the petals to leak a little bit that became attractive to the beetle, the beetle calls across them, gets free sugar, and then looks to another flower to get free sugar and ends up pollinating the other flower. That means that plant is gonna have more babies, right? And so its babies all have the leaky cell. And then over a few, couple million years, you end up with specialized nectaries for that beetle. So both flowers have been designed by bugs and pollinators like birds, and there's a reciprocal feedback between the two. But the fruits have also been designed by animals. So fleshy fruit that is tasty and goes through an animal track will one, have the chemistry it needs to break down and also probably come out the other end of the animal far away from where it was eaten so that there's less competition between the plant and its mother plant. All right, the angiosperms have the complex uh, vascular tissue. They can self or cross fertilize. So a lot of plants are self infertile. Um, if you're pollinating some of your garden plants, you have to pollinate them. Or if you're uh, like fruit trees, some of the pawpaws are self infertile, some of them, and then some of them can self fertilize. So uh, they make seeds, these angiosperms do, and then there's two major groups. One's called a monopot. That's because one little leaf comes out at the seedling stage, that's your corn, things like corn and grass. And then the eudicots used to be called dicots. Um, they have two or more leaves coming out with that first little seedling. All right, started to go off on a segue there. I come back to it. Yeah, so um, what do you guys think would be, how are we doing on time? Oh, we got time. Okay, question for you. So what do you think would be the advantage to being self-fertile? And is there an advantage to being able to cross-fertilize, cross-pollinate? Yes, <laughs> there are advantages. I, I I would assume, but I can't, I can't imagine what they are. I mean, obviously, it's easier to self fertilize. Yes, you would. Go ahead, Danya. 
Yeah, I was. I've been driving, by the way. Hi, everybody. I, I think um, I think you'd be a lot stronger. Um, just overall, the the whatever the species is would be stronger if it was cross pollination. Pollination. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you're both right. That's great. Yes. So the self fertilizing is easier. It means uh, you can just fertilize while the flower is opening or without even opening the flowers. You could save a lot of energy and you're self fertile and you're good to go. And um, cross fertilization, however, means that you're going to have a more complex genome or set of DNA and that can lead to more. Um, resistant immune function or a stronger immune function. So humans are typically attracted to people that have a very different immune system than their own. And that allows for the offspring to have a more robust immune system. It's like, it's got a bigger arsenal. It's got dad's arsenal and mom's arsenal. And so the offspring are actually going to be more resistant or have a better immune system than either parent from cross fertilization. Now, you can have the transmission of disease through cross fertilization as well. So there's lots of uh, negatives um, and it could cut down on the number, especially as we see pollinator losses happening, uh, the number of offspring. So you lose pollinators, you lose uh, a lot more than the pollinators. Okay, so the angiosperms are the flowering plants, like I said, they took over the planet. So they came, um, they're pretty late in the fossil record. But once they started happening, they just exploded in terms of speciation. And that's thought to be in large part because of this interaction both between microbes and the pollinators that allowed for this massive bloom in speciation, pardon the pun. So evolution is still really, really slow, but the uh, tens of millions of years is very, very fast for a bunch of new species to arise, right? So it's slow from our perspective, but fast from the perspective of evolution. And it's the birds and the bees that help to make this happen, which I think is an excellent story about how collaboration is actually far more powerful in evolutionary biology and in ecology in general than um, the idea of nature red in tooth and claw. So. All right, so this is just a quick uh, description of differences between monocots and eudicots. So the monocots are gonna have that one little leaf coming out in the seedling. These are your corns and grasses. They don't have very complex flowers. They don't seem to, although if you put a grass seed under a scope, which I don't recommend, um, but I've done it, they are actually quite complex. Uh, they have no secondary growth, so they don't do a lot of branching. So your secondary growth is gonna to lead to both girth, but also that massive branching pattern you get in your rhododendrons. You're not gonna see that in monocots. And then they have a more fibrous root, no tap root, uh, and their veins will be parallel to each other. So you get that really beautiful, streamlined, parallel, clean veination. Whereas in um, things like uh, rhododendron or azaleas or any other of the eudicots, um, they're going to have much more complex nut-like venation. So some of the uh, monocots that do produce an exceptional flower would be the orchids. Okay, that's good enough on that. All right, so the angiosperm flower, it's quite a complicated little thing. Uh, and they're actually quite uh, different in terms of the various tissue types that they have. So all of these tissue types that are outside of the ovary here in the center are basically to protect the pollen in the anther and to protect that ovary. So these will be enfolded in the bud by sepals and that helps to prevent exposure to um, extreme temperatures or moisture loss and allows for these ovaries to mature and the stigma and pollen to mature so that once the flower opens up, it is available for business, so to speak. These petals and sometimes the sepals or tepals, when you have the two of them together, will oftentimes have landing pads on them. So they'll have stripes that tell the pollinating bee or wasp here, you know, land here, this is a good landing place, you can get a good firm hold as you get slightly drunk off the nectar, right? So they're really complex um, 
tissue types and organs are kind of amazing. And then these little anthers will have hundreds, thousands, tons of little teeny tiny pollen in there. And these anthers and pollen will get picked up by the pollinator on the wing or on the muzzle of a bat or the um, leg of a bee, right? And then get transmitted to another plant for pollination. I'm gonna go through that a little bit fast. Just thought maybe have questions. So this is a great example of how, so I mentioned the first pollination was probably beetles. And that led eventually to this, what's called a positive feedback between the morphology of the pollinator. So what it looks like, or at least it's proboscis, it's mouth part, and the shape and where the nectar is in the flower. So here you've got, as well as the chemistry of the flower, right? So whatever chemical signal that flower is gonna send off is also gonna be specific if it is courting a specific pollinator. There are a lot of flowers that will are generalist. Um, your uh, Queen Anne's lace can be pollinated by ants and solitary bees and flies. It's a generalist, but campion, which is pictured here, a lot of the campions or the delphiniums and also the orchids, are very specialized. They've come up with a special relationship with their pollinator. So uh, the delphinium has got a nice landing space for its um, bee. It releases a particular type of chemistry that is attractive to bees. And, um, and it's got a shallow throat for the nectary for that bee. Whereas here you've got in this campion here, it's got a very long throat, so the nectary is perfect for the tongue of a um, hummingbird. And then will also be seeded such that it's um, the bird approaches it, it's not going to have trouble in terms of any sort of interference with the way the flower is presented, so to speak, in space. So the bird is um, safe to get a hold of it. And then to the right, you've got the hawk moth. This is a famous coevolutionary or positive feedback model where um, sometimes in evolutionary textbooks, you'll see that the flower that the hawk moth pollinates, it gets a longer and longer throat on it. And, the, and in tandem, the hawk moth's tongue or proboscis gets longer and longer with it. So very specific. Um, in terms of chemistry and mimicry, or a lot of orchids will mimic the um, shape or image of the fly or bee that pollinates it. And so when the bee is trying to copulate with what it thinks is a female, it's actually picking up these little pollen sacs. And a lot of times these will smell um, sort of like rotting flesh, much like the flower I talked about earlier. All right. Um, so questions? Just a real quick one. Is there a resource, so you, you mentioned Queen Anne's versus an orchid, generalist versus a specialist. Is there like a handy reference that I can, you know, that you can point me to so I can kind of know which ones in the field are more generalist and others that are specialist? Uh, you know, I don't know of a reference, but I'm gonna that question and I'll see if I can find you one I can I can tell you that that you see a long throat in a plant mm -hmm. versus a flat face so to speak like a rose has more of a flat face or a sunflower has a flat face mm -hmm. if they don't have a lot of depth to them they're probably pollinated by a diversity they're a generalist okay but if, if you've got this um like the irises have depth and they also have that crazy fuzziness on the inner part of the um, petal. Right. And that shows a, a little bit more specificity. There's a lot of different types of bees that can pollinate the iris, but that landing pad says bee. It says something needs to land on there. It could be a, um, a bee fly. Those will also pollinate them. But it says something short and stout needs to land on there and gain purchase. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah, you. so I yeah, sure. So um yeah, I will contact you after this to remind you to email me so I so I remember to look for it. All right. Okay. 
So hybridization, okay. So, I would just okay. curious one thing on the, can yeah. you have, are there opportunists that can do both self and cross fertilization? Plants, yes, for sure. So there's a, a group of flowers called campion or, um, oh man, the flowers that grow out here that are often wetland habitat flowers. And if you, if you grab the seeds at the right time, they explode and pop off in your hand. Um, there's a lot of, those are two kinds. There's a lot of flowers that will actually self-fertilize and also cross. So they're okay. hedging their beds. Yeah, great question. All right, and then the monoecious and dioecious, we went through sex versus selfing, so I'm gonna skip past that. But so the monoecious trees or plants, they have a house, they're basically hermaphrodites, okay? So this is a hermaphrodite, it's monoecious. You've got both male and female flowers in that sunflower. So the ray flowers out here, they could be males. And then these flowers inside here where the seeds will be produced, these are all female flowers. Whereas things like the ginkgo are dioecious. That just means di two ecious house, two houses. One is male and one is female. And that's what you see in a lot of gymnosperms and a few angiosperms. Okay, so we went through this. And then hybridization. A lot of people are disturbed by genetically modified organisms. But in nature, genetic modification comes through hybridization. And it's another way that we get speciation through increased diversity. So hybridization, a natural hybrid that occurred was the grapefruit. So this was just these two, the pomelo and the orange were very, very different, making very, very different fruit, but they weren't so different that they couldn't produce a fruit, okay? A lot of times the hybrids uh, will allow a plant to sort of um, move in space. So the helianthus or the sunflowers, they're incredibly speciose, tons of different species. And a lot of that speciation has happened as a result of hybridization. So this might hybridize with a, a sunflower that's, um, this might be in a slightly more moist habitat. And then it just happens to get cross pollen and be fertile with a plant that's the same genus, but different species close enough related that they could actually have viable offspring. And that plant over there, let's say this is the male plant, it can handle slightly drier habitat. Well, the offspring of these two different plants, much like we were talking about the immune system, may be able to inhabit a new habitat that neither parent could survive. Or it might be able to be resistant to a pathogen that attacks both parents, but it can survive. It won't kill it. So hybridization is the genetic input of new information into an existing genome, species genome. That's the thing, same thing as genetically modif modifying an organism. So is, is, is there a case then to be made that GMO is actually increasing diversity in plants? So GMOs are complicated, right? Um, yes, you could say that they are, they have a, there's the possibility of increasing diversity. It depends on how a GMO is made and for what purpose. If scientists are introducing a single gene or even just a couple of genes that make it um, resistant to a, a, a glyphosate, right? Like Roundup, so that you can spray the whole agricultural crop and with Roundup to kill all the weeds, but the plant you've got with the GMO is resistant that is not going to actually lead to diversity. That's going to destroy diversity because that plant is gonna become weedy, most likely, and then move into maybe urban systems in which there's a lot of glyphosate being sprayed and it could potentially take over. So you could actually lose diversity as GMOs. When GMOs are most successful is when there's a lot of different types of genes put in a, what's called a cassette, and then that cassette is put in the plant to make it have, say, like golden rice has a ton of vitamin A in it as a way to deal with um, the lack of nutrition in, in impoverished countries, right? So if you can throw a cassette of a bunch of vitamins into a plant, that's not going to have necessarily a negative effect on the ecology surrounding that plant, but it will serve a purpose 
to the humanity that relies on that plant. So it depends on how the GMO is made and what the goal of the GMO is, right? Whether or not it has an ecological footprint that's detrimental or not. Make sense? Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so plants, they're sitting around there. They can't really move. Um, I mean, they grow, they move in the wind, but they need to defend themselves. And they have some really great ways to defend themselves in terms of chemistry. So we saw those trichomes with the hairs that could be made of glass. That's one way they can defend themselves. Black walnut and other plants will make what are called allelochemicals. And these will be sort of um, escape from the roots and they're poisonous. They basically try to poison the habitat for anything else around them. Okay, so um, if you've ever gone out to the Sonoran Desert, you'll see creosote bush. If you see creosote flats, it's where there's just this almost uniform distribution of these creosote shrubs. And that's because they've essentially poisoned the soil around them so that they don't have to compete with anything else. Resources are incredibly limited. Allelochemistry is a great way to compete. Um, of course, other plants have evolved to be able to withstand that. So you'll see some low-lying plants around the creosote um, or around the black walnut. Phenolics, these are what give us headaches in wine. These are defensive compounds. So they're a way for, if the plant starts to get, the insect makes it past the hairs and towards the stem of the plant, they chomp into it, they're gonna get a mouthful of poison. Um, see, so there's these physical barriers uh, also. So what's really cool about the hackberry, I don't know if you guys have noticed the warty uh, bark of a hackberry or of a um, winged elm. They have this warty bark as well. That is um, thought to have evolved as a result of the fact that there used to be a giant sloth in the Appalachians, in the Appalachian Mountains. And because the giant sloth, even though it had big claw, between all those big claws were those soft, squishy pads. And so this, and there's another tree called the Robinia honey locust, huge thorns, or the devil's walking stick, also huge thorns. Those were all around during the time of this giant um, sloth. And so these were uh, bark extrusions or um, appendages that helped keep that sloth from climbing up the canopy and devouring a bunch of leaves. And then plants can also do things like shift the amount of carbon versus the amount of nitrogen in their leaves. So if they have a lot of carbon in their leaf, they're not as tasty and they're harder to digest. And so in um, some conditions when the resources get really limited, plants will actually not uptake nitrogen and like store it into the roots instead or even in their microbial members as a way to change the leaf tissue carbon and nitrogen ratio and make themselves less interesting to eat. All right, and with that, I'll answer any questions in a little bit over. Hopefully that was interesting, useful. I'm gonna take my screen away. Well, hold on. And I'm gonna to try to put up here. So, Donya, are you still driving? Okay, I'm gonna guess you're still driving. So if you can see this and you're not still driving, then contact me here if you have any suggestions. This is the first time I've given this Botany 101 and I'd really like some ideas. If this was not what you were expecting, please let me know. Um, I wanna make it interesting and useful for people both. So your suggestions are welcome, especially if they're delivered gently and also any questions you might have. Otherwise, yeah, thank I you. That was a, oh. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just saying it, it was a lot of information. It was um, there's a lot to take in there, um, but it was it was all very <laughs> interesting, very interesting. No, and I think it laid out pretty well. Um, so thank okay, you. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah I thanks. agree. I, I agree. It was a lot of lot of information, but it was very helpful. Okay, I can I can pare it down. So. All right, great. I will email you guys after this. Thanks a lot for attending and um, have a good night.
You Thank too. You. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Elizabeth. Bye-bye. Drive safe. <laughs> Thank okay.